So with that, I would like to move directly to our first talk, um, which is by Dr. Robert Keene. Um, Dr. Keene is a research ecologist at the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station at the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab. He is, uh, works on a number of different kinds of topics, develops uh, computer simulation models for uh, landscape fire and climate dynamics. He does field research on mapping fuel characteristics and has, in particular relevance to today, has been looking at the ecology and restoration of white bark pine. So, Dr. Keene. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming, and thank you for the organizers for asking me to talk today. I'm pleased to present a subject that is very near and dear to my heart and some people in the audiences. And when you talk about restoring the West, please don't forget this little known but very important ecosystem that we have in the Northern Rockies called the Whitebark Pine Ecosystem. Okay, so this doesn't work. Oh, you do? I'll keep going while we go. There is a really important tree in the high. Oh, yeah, there we go. In the high elevations of the Rockies, it's not only a very beautiful tree, an aesthetically pleasing tree, but it also performs a wide variety of ecosystem functions and services that many humans appreciate and many animals depend upon. This uh, tree, the white bark pine, forms forests that are not only aesthetically pleasing to walk through, and a lot of people uh, target their recreation activities to it, but it's also a tree that has, uh, grows these cones, and the seeds in the cones are very important food for many, many species of animals, which we'll talk about later. It's, believe it or not, it, uh, in the Northern Rockies, it constitutes about 15% of the landscape, which is kind of a lot greater, almost twice as much as the ponderosa pine, which gets all the press. And it, because it's one of the only species that ex can exist at the high elevations, it is protect snowpack and delay snow melt so that humans have high quality water for irrigation down below over longer parts of the season. It provides very critical habitat to a number of species, but there are also a lot of plant species that depend on whitebark pine and are obligate to whitebark pine forests. Uh, the, can only be found there. And while it is the only species that is at the high elevation species, it also contributes to landscape structure and function because it creates corridors and pass passageways for not only an animal migration, but for plant migration as well. But again, it's that ability to produce those cones to provide food for those animals, which really makes it a keystone or foundation species in the high elevation of the Rockies. <coughs> As many of you know, we are now seeing a massive decline in whitebark pine that was first identified by Steve Arno in 86, but we're seeing major mountain pine beetle epidemics in Yellowstone, and the blister rust is killing a lot of trees around in the Bob Marshall and Glacier, and we see both those actions happening in the celery bitterroot, and this decline is almost now starting to be range-wide, of which we really have to start looking at and start de uh, designing, if we want to save this valuable ecosystem, designing restoration strategies so that we can at least maintain it or conserve it into the future. It is kind of important now, and it's recognized important because it is now slated to be listed as an endangered species by the, in the, under the ESA. It's an A2 priority, and so uh, it's only uh, precluded by the backlog. So it is uh, a candidate endangered species now, if we want to restore it, we really have to look at those factors that are causing the decline. And the decline is the result of many interacting factors, of which a lot of times it's very difficult to understand how they interact and all that stuff. But it is our ability to address these interactions which will dictate whether or not we can be successful in restora restoring these uh, ecosystems. So in a nutshell, we have what I think is a box and arrow diagram which simplifies all the interactions. Of course, this is an exclusion area. There are a lot of other things that uh, white bark pine depends upon, but in the middle, in the orange boxes, you'll see the, what we call the three-legged stool of white bark pine restoration, which is the species itself, the wildland fire, which it depends on, and the Clark's nutcracker. We're going to go into great detail about that three-legged stool in a, in a, in a minute. 
But that is, if you don't address all those three boxes, you're not going to be able to restore white bark pine. The red boxes are the, th the factors that are causing the, uh, the decline, which is the uh, white pine blister rust, mountain pine beetle, and the way we manage our lands, most specifically how we do fire management. And of course, that blue box is climate. And climate is one that we kind of assume is a background factor. But what I'm going to tell you is that we just assumed too much, uh, and we didn't really address that climate box very well. So let's go. What I'm going to do is go through each one of these boxes and talk about uh, these individual boxes and their interactions so that we can understand not only what's controlling the decline, but how to restore it. So a white bark pine is a five needle pine, which means, of course, it's susceptible to blister rust. It is very long lived. There are many individuals that are greater than 500 years, and the oldest is much greater than uh, 1,300 years uh, old and is, exists just uh, north in southern Idaho, north of here. It is a shade intolerant species, which means from a restoration standpoint that it, in a lot of parts of its range, it will eventually be replaced or outcompeted by three main conifers, subalpin fir, Engelmann spruce, and uh, mountain hemlock, uh, depending on the site. So uh, since it's shade tolerant, it'll, uh, all, it depends on other disturbances to get rid of those shade tolerant species, and, uh, it because it will eventually be succeeded in, uh, by the shade tolerance. White bark pine is amazingly drought tolerant because it is not only deep rooted, but it has a large sapwood and it has the ability to close the stomates and actually suffer through drought. So it's a very drought tolerant conifer, which would me indicate that it probably will do quite well in the future. Its range, of course, I think its range is the central Rocky, uh, the central part of the northern Rocky Mountains uh, in the U.S. Of course, it goes all the way up into Canada. And you can find, find it in, down the spine of the Cascades and also in the Sierra Nevadas. But also more important is where it exists on the landscape elevationally. And it is just below alpine and in those tree line communities that we see here, uh, timber line communities, is where white bark pine is the only species that can exist there. And it is not succeeded by subalpine fir. And it constitutes anywhere from 8 to 15 percent of the landscape. The rest of the upper subalpine is where white bark pine lives and grows and produces cones. And it is here where it is eventually succeeded by subalpine fir, Engelmann spruce, and mountain hemlock. As I mentioned, it's a very important food. It produces cones that do not open. And these cones that do not open have seeds that do not have wings, which is odd for a conifer. And of course, is the primary indicator that it is dispersed by uh, other means than wind. So uh, these seeds are quite big. They're the biggest seeds of any conifer we have in the northern Rockies. And uh, they are large, nutritious, and enjoyed by many species of animals uh, that use the, seed, uh, use the seed. And some of the animals are om almost obligate to whitebark pine, like the blue grouse, for uh, having, uh, 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 enjoying the seed in this diet. Uh, one of the main species that most people are familiar with is the uh, dependence of white bark pine seeds by the grizzly bear. Grizzly bear, when there's a good cone crop, of course, grizzly bears utilize white bark pine uh, seeds quite uh, frequently because the seed, the cones are harvested by squirrels, cached on the grounds in middens, which the grizzly bears raid. So white bark pine and grizzly bears enjoy a, a kind of a comfortable relationship, although the squirrel would like uh, beg to differ. The big one, of course, the consumer of seed is this chucklehead which is the Clark's Nutcracker. The Clark's Nutcracker is an amazing bird with an amazing memory, able to memorize where it plants the seeds across the landscape, uh, thousands of caches that it puts on the ground. It has, of course, co-evolved with whitebark pine uh, to be able to disperse these seeds across the landscape. And as such, it is the primary seed dispersal vector for whitebark pine. It caches its seed, it opens up the cones with its beak, and it has an uh, evolved uh, hole underneath its tongue that goes to a sublingual pouch, which is rare in any bird. It flies across the landscape at great distances, uh, up to more than 10, and people have documented 60 kilometers away, to cache these seeds on the ground about an inch deep in caches that are 1 to 20 uh, to 30 seeds in a cache. The caches that it doesn't reclaim, of course, will be the white bark pine seed, and they are the, the start of the white bark pine forest of the future, right? They have no uh, knowledge of any white bark pine tree that established itself from anything else but a clock's nutcracker cache. 
So the nutcrackers love to cache anywhere, but the areas that it caches where whitebark pine can grow, of course, are open areas. The nutcracker remembers where it cached using pattern recognition. So where are the open areas that have a lot of pattern on the landscape where there's no canopy for it to uh, get in the way of recognizing the pattern? And of course, those are the burned areas that we have on the landscape across most of the Rockies. These burned areas are rich in pattern, as shown below. And these pattern, of course, entice the nutcracker to cache there. And because all the other species of trees are gone, the white bark can grow, pine can grow there uh, because it's shade intolerant and, and can't handle competition and can grow into a mature tree, a cone producing individual. So you cannot talk about uh, white bark pine uh, ecosystem dynamics without mentioning fire because fire is where we're going to see where a lot of the, the white bark pine is going to be cached. And unfortunately, fire is very difficult in white bark pine. It is a muddled mess because you can get any number of fires occurring any time over a wide variety of intervals. Uh, the, the, it's been documented that the fire return intervals are anywhere from 80, 8, 80 to 500 years. And we can get any one of the three main fire severity types. The stand replacement fires are the great ones where white bark pine uh, has a colonization advantage over the wind dispersed. Uh, competitors that it would uh, compete with because the Clark's Nutcracker can disperse seeds orders of magnitude further than wind can disperse seeds of its competitors. So stand replacement fires are very important. But mixed severity fires are important as well because even though the Nutcracker can cache in these large burns, it would rather cache in smaller patches because it has a, a snoot full of seeds. So what it does then is it it actually caches more seeds in mixed severity burns or mixed severity patches than it does in the large burns. Non-lethal surface fires are important because they clean out the understory. White bark pine has the advantage, is better able to survive fires because of its higher crown, deeper roots, and it doesn't have thicker bark. So, uh, but it is able to survive these fires better than any of its competitors. In fact, uh, it is uh, much better able to survive fire than subalpine fir, which is its main component. So as far as fire is concerned, you can get any type of fire occurring anywhere, and all of them will benefit white bark pine, especially if they're a higher severity fire, it benefits regeneration. If it's a lower severity fire, it benefits the growing environment. So there in the nutshell is the three-legged stool of the restoration triangle. Now we're going to talk about the factors that cause the decline, the red boxes. The first thing is the white pine blister rust. And what's important to know in the restoration uh, context is that it is an exotic disease brought over from Europe around 1910. And because of this exotic, there is very little resistance in the native populations. This has been documented anywhere from 1 to 5%. But recent evidence by, from Mary Frances Mahalovich shows that it's really around 1 or less than 1% natural resistance. So one tree out of 100 usually has the resistance, uh, some sort of resistance. And of course, these days, they, they don't really talk about resistance anymore. They talk about its ability to survive. There is no real such thing as resistance. It's ability to survive with the disease. So uh, what's uh, important is that the disease kills from the top down, which means it removes the cones first while the tree still lives and so on. And because it is an exotic disease and there's very little resistance, every restoration strategy has to recognize resistance in its uh, design, which means that we have to start breeding and uh, uh, taking seed from uh, phenotypically rust-resistant trees, testing the resistance in the nursery, growing seedlings from those uh, tested individuals, and then outplanting the resistant individuals based on how much uh, resistance it has. So uh, resistance is very important and is, the, is one of the foundation of the whole restoration uh, strategy that we've developed. The next one is mountain pine beetle. This is a native disease and uh, everything would have been fine in mountain pine beetle if we'd have let fires burn, if we didn't get blister rust, uh, and we don't get climate change. But in the last 15 years, we see major mortality events of uh, white bark pine by mountain pine beetle because of the very warm climates that are conducive to mountain pine beetle uh, uh, growth and uh, outbreak uh, status. And uh, 
uh, and the fact that was, since we've been putting out fires for so long, we have a lot of the landscape into host trees or trees of sufficient size and species that will allow a, an outbreak to actually heighten and even be greater than it would be uh, naturally. So mountain pine beetles, the big thing we worry about there is that we can't really uh, save entire forests from the mountain pine beetle, but what we really want to do is make sure that they don't kill our rust resistant individuals because they are the foundation of any restoration and strategy. And of course, last is the management, namely fire exclusion. You can't really see or analyze the uh, adverse effects of fire exclusion yet because of the long fire return intervals in white bark pine, but it is obvious that if we put out fires, we will not create those open areas that will entice the nutcracker to actually cache there and will allow the uh, white bark pine to actually grow. So fire exclusion uh, is one of the things that will, uh, 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 is one of the factors that attribute to decline, but it isn't the, the entire causal mechanism. It is only a, 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 fa a factor that exacerbates the rust in the beetles. So now we talked about the decline and we talked about the three-legged stool of, restor of, of restoration strategy. So a bunch of us got together and over the course of about five years developed a restoration strategy based on uh, what people were doing out there, based on the literature and so on. It came out in 2011 and it is a strategy that looks at things at multiple scales and so on. It, uh, the strategy itself is composed of uh, four guiding principles, promote rust resistance, conserve genetic diversity, save the seed sources, and employ restoration treatments. And you can do that with 10 actions, 10 possible actions from implementing treatments, protecting seed trees, and so on. And all these are detailed in the restoration strategy. Uh, the restoration strategy, I'm gonna, in a nutshell, the most effective thing that we can do right now is to identify our plus trees or our rush resistant trees, make sure that they're resistant through extensive testing, collect seeds from those trees, plant them or uh, grow seedlings uh, with those seeds and then outplant them into the burns and treated areas that we have on the landscape. And that is the primary and probably most efficient way we can do uh, restoration right now. Once we've done that, there are many other things we can do to help out restoration and conserve white bark pine, but that's the first and foremost thing we can do. So as soon as we put out this restoration strategy, we immediately got back from the managers some pretty important feedback. Is that, hey, you know, they said, we've been reading the literature too, and hey, everything says that white bark pine is gonna be pushed off the tops of the mountains. So, you know, what, what's the deal here? Why are you telling us to go and put in treatments that probably future climates will render ineffective? Why should we do this and throw away money like that? And so what we realized is that we really didn't pay attention to the blue box. We didn't really uh, take and put the detail into the restoration strategy that would talk about what you should do with these things if cli uh, when climate change is actually going to happen. So to the rescue came the GNLCC, the Great Northern Landscape Cooperative. Uh, they gave us uh, uh, some money to go ahead and put together a companion guide to the restoration strategy uh, that would assess for each one of those guiding principles and 10 restoration uh, strategies what we could do to actually improve the efficacy of those treatments into the future. The efficacy of planting, of doing uh, thinnings to take out the shade tolerant trees and so on. W where should we do it? When should we do it? And so on. So this companion strategy is kind of mirrors the design of the restoration strategy and it was developed from two separate sources, an extensive literature search that we did, and then also a simulation experiment. Uh, and then we compiled the results from those two and then reported out recommendations for each one of those restoration strategies on how you can make those strategies more effective in the future under climate change. The other thing too is there was a lot of contradictory information out there that uh, about what happens to white bark pine in the future. And so we also wanted to clear some of that up. Is, uh, so what will happen to white bark pine in the future? And this was, this what I'm gonna show here next is a result of our literature search that we did for the companion document. And if you want to look at the impacts of white bark pine and climate change, you have to look at three things. This isn't exclusionary, there are many other things you can look at, but if you don't look at these three main things, you're kinda missing the picture. 
Number one is, what are the changes in the growing environment or the biophysical environment that will change white bark pine? Will it be directly affected by changes in climate in its growth, mortality, and regeneration? And then, of course, disturbance, the changes in disturbance because of climate, and then the changes in bird behavior. So what we're going to look at is the changes in biophysical environment. And if you look at all the studies that predict white bark pine is going to be gone are species distributional models, where they correlate today's climate with where the species is, and then put tomorrow's climate in and see where the species will be. All of these predict the demise of white bark pine. But if you dive in the literature and look at the individual attributes of the species, and the people that looked at the ecophysiology, they found that white bark pine will actually do quite well in the future. There are several other modeling experiments, ecosystem models, that show that white bark pine, there's going to be actually an increase in white bark pine in productivity, both in growth and in comb production. So a lot of studies, if you exclude a lot of the species distribution modeling, we find that the environment up there is going to actually be very conducive to growth. Number one is you're still going to get plenty of precipitation. The precipitation is not going to change. If anything, it's going to grow a little higher. The second thing is that you're going to have longer growing seasons, which means that these species can, uh, the species that exist up there can take advantage of this longer growing season. And in fact, we're in the middle of a big study where we're taking ringwits from white bark pine and finding that there are huge changes in white bark pine growth. It's increasing double in some areas, uh, the growth. And of course, we're hoping that this correlates with cone pro production. The, of course, the downside of this is that other species are also going to be experience increased growth, which means it's going to accelerate succession. So as far as the changes in climate, biophysical environment, if you believe the species distribution models, it says that white bark pine is doomed. If you believe the ecosystem models, it says the white bark pine is going to do fine. One thing everybody agrees on is uh, disturbance is going to change, and disturbance is going to get more frequent and more intense. Fires are predicted to have longer fire seasons, more lightning, greater uh, fire sizes, more fire, uh, higher fire frequencies, and greater intensity because of the increase in production, which creates more fuel, which means that this, the uh, fires are going to be more intense. Uh, but white bark pine is able to survive fire better than its competitors. So even with the increase in fire, will white bark pine make out better because it can survive fire? It's very difficult to know. But one thing we do know is that if the fire frequency uh, is, is smaller, or if, there, if fires are so frequent that the fire return interval is less than the cone, cone uh, maturation period, then we're really worried. In other words, white bark pine loves to take its time to produce cones. It doesn't really start producing cones until about 40 to 80 years, and it really doesn't become optimal in producing cones to 200. So if fire return intervals are less than 200 years, we kind of start to worry because we're going to get a decrease in, in white bark pine regeneration. Everything also predicts the increase in disease, uh, rust, there's going to be uh, more wave years, which means that there are going to be more years where you're going to have weather that's conducive for the, not only the spread, but also the infection of the disease. The window of these wave years, the number of days, are going to increase, apparently, from these uh, climate models. And they also mention that there's probably going to, with the climate, it's going to cause mutation of the disease a lot more. But we don't really worry about rust because everything the restoration strategy says is to enhance rust resistance. And if we enhance rust resistance, what we pray is that the mutation of the rust won't overcome whatever resistance we've been uh, enhancing. And lastly, of course, mountain pine beetles are predicted to uh, increase. And, you know, white bark pine is the ice cream of their meal. They just love uh, white bark pine and are able not only to kill it very quickly, but they kill a lot of trees in a stand. And we see in Yellowstone 80, 90, sometimes close to 100% mortality in these uh, trees. The big key here is that uh, to not let white, uh, the beetle build up such populations that it'll overwhelm any defenses or any of the weather that happens. And so uh, here what we are advocating in, the, in the, uh, the strategy is to create heterogeneous landscapes, not only in the upper subalpine, but in the lower subalpine, so that the, if the uh, beetle populations build up, they won't be so high as to overwhelm every tree in the landscape. Quite frankly, we just don't know what's going to happen to the bird. I can't believe anything will happen to the bird, to be honest with you, with climate change there. Uh, Diana Tomback wrote this section, and she found that uh, 
it's, an, it's a really opportunistic species. It can handle a lot of changes in the environment and so on. The big thing we worry about the bird is that if whitebark pine populations get low, too low, the bird stops becoming a disperser and starts becoming a predator. And what we do is we shove that whitebark pine down that, the, you know, the vortex, the Ali effect, and uh, we uh, accelerate its decline across the landscape because uh, the nutcracker is actually uh, not caching enough seeds to maintain the species. So we worry about the fact that the nutcracker becomes the seed predator and actually uh, minimizes or uh, reduces regeneration. So that was, in a nutshell, our literature search. Let's go to the model that we used. We've been developing a model at the Fire Lab for at least, well, since 1990. Uh, it's called Fire BGC. It's the second version V2. It's a landscape model, and it models uh, ecosystem processes like evapotranspiration, uh, photosynthesis, and so on. <coughs> it is not a species distribution model. It's an actual ecosystem model that simulates actual tree growth up to a landscape level. And it recognizes all stands on the landscape. And the biggest thing about Fire BGC is that it contains explicit representations of all the boxes that are in the, uh, the box and arrow diagram. It includes a Clark's Nutcracker seed dispersal model and a Nutcracker population model. It includes mountain pine beetle populations, blister rust, and also fire uh, management. So it, it contains all of these, so we're able to look at changes in whitebark pine in the right context under climate change. <clears throat> it's a, as I said, it's a landscape model, so you, can, you can't apply it regionally. You can only apply it to a landscape. And of course, there are many things that white fire BGC simulates that are spatially explicit, such as fire spread, the spread of the diseases, seed dispersal, and so on. So uh, we looked at two landscapes, the crown of the continent in Glacier, and then one in west uh, central Montana, the, uh, what we call the East Fork of the Bitterroot. And we had a pretty extensive simulation experiment where we looked at three climate scenarios, the historical scenario, the uh, RCP 4.5, which is two and a half degrees warmer with 10% more precip, and the RCP 8.5 for white bark pine for these two areas, and it's, uh, I think it's 5.5 degrees warmer and 10% less precip. We did three fire, uh, fire management things where we didn't suppress any fires. We did a wildland fire use where we suppressed 50. And then we did business as usual, which is 92% uh, suppression of, of all initial uh, ignitions. Then we put in restoration treatments at no levels, at low levels, and, which is 10 hectares a year, and high levels, which is 100 hectares a year. The restoration treatment was a pretty comprehensive thinning of the subalpine fern in and spruce with a prescribed burn that was put in at an intensity to make sure that white bark pine uh, survived and uh, it killed a lot of subalpine fir. And then we also had planting where we planted rust resistant individuals. The resistance level was 30% and we did uh, 10 hectares a year and 100 hectares a year. Here is the result. Now I'm going to tell you is the climate change scenario that we had, we took from, it's, uh, it has a long history and it's uh, extrapolated down to four kilometers. And it's only for 100 years. So we, the results here are from 100 years of simulation. And I'm going to tell you right now that 100 years of simulation is not long enough to look at white bark pine dynamics. But we didn't have any weather past 100 years. So I'm going to show you, after we're all done, I'm going to show you the weather that we contrived to be past 100 years and show you why that's different. But if we looked at over that 100 years, if we looked at basal area, we see that the green boxes are the historic climate and the blue boxes are the future climate. If we look at the different columns, we see the suppression level is none to the far left column and it's the suppression level is high, 92%, at the far right column. And if we look at the horizontal axes for all of these, we see there's three restoration levels. There's no restoration, low restoration, and high restoration. So right off the bat, you can see two things that should strand out for you in this. Number one is that white bark pine actually has higher basal area for the East Fork of the Bitterroot in the future. And number two, even a low level of, re of restoration will actually increase the basal area of these trees in the future. Uh, and uh, this, uh, the other thing is that the two rows are planting. And notice that the planting really had no 
real effect. And this is, again, because it's only 100 years. Because white bark pine doesn't uh, have cones until 40 or 80 years, you, it's impossible to see the effects of planting unless you're simulating for several centuries. So that's why planting didn't have an effect. Now let's take a look at the landscape composition and uh, look at uh, the landscape composition and the uh, y-axis is the percent of the upper elevation landscape or a proportion of the high, uh, upper elevation landscape. And then these boxes are the species that are there. The first box, the green box, is subalpine fir. The next one is white bark pine. And the next one is Engelmann spruce. Uh, and it goes from, uh, and these columns are suppression levels from uh, no suppression to high suppression. As we saw before, it really had no effect. Now, the big thing is, is that this is no restoration at the top to high restoration at the bottom. And you can see as we go through, you can see that any restoration, if we do nothing, we're going to get landscapes of alpine fir. If we at least do something, we're going to get white bark pine on the landscape. And if we restore and plant, we're going to have landscapes that aren't the historical analogs, but they're enough to maintain that uh, ecosystem on the landscape. What's going to happen in the future? Well, as we saw in the first slide, it looks like white bark pine is just going to do great in the future. And instead of being the 25 to 50 percent it was in the past, if we restore, we can get it up to 75, 50 to 75 percent in the future. So things look bright and merry for the East Fork of the Bitterroot if we do restoration and we're able to manage that rust resistance. Big thing is the crown of the continent was exactly the opposite of this. White bark pine is doomed in a lot of that landscape. And the main reason is because fire can't get in there because of its, uh, there's a lot of scree and so on, and there's a whole bunch of other things. But if you, the uh, results for the crown of the continent were exactly the opposite of this. Uh, the, the climate was different up there and so on. So what climate change effects are going to happen are really localized. They're, you can't really have a silver bullet that's going to be extrapolated everywhere. So as I said, that was 100 years of weather. Here is 500 years of weather where we simulated 500 years of weather using a weather generator. And here's the deal, is that you can see the 100 years, the first 100 years, the years that we sampled, there's a decline of white bark pine, right, because of the blister rust. It's not climate, it's the blister rust. It is climate for the crown. The uh, red and yellow lines are future climate. Uh, and you can see that for... Uh, uh, the crown of the continent, you can see white bark pine will stay on the landscape, but it'll be a minor component. It, won't, it come, won't come close to playing the role it did historically before we had rust. But on the east fork of the Bitterroot, we see the proportion of the landscape inhabited by white bark pine is going to be the same as it was in the past. Note a couple things is that this dip here is the result of the rust killing all the white bark pine that are not resistant. And this gain that we have is you can see resistance slowly building up on the landscape. The take home message is we're in it for the long haul. We gotta you know, be, have the commitment. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that white bark pine, there is, there are a, there is some evidence that shows it, will, it can leave the high elevation landscapes. But there are also evidence that it will exist up there in a lot of the Northern Rocky Mountain landscapes. We're going to do uh, several more landscapes to validate this effort, but I think we'll find the same thing, is that white bark pine is a lot greater speed, uh, has a lot wider uh, environmental niche than a lot of people think. As a matter of fact, we're doing a study on uh, the Beaverhead Deer Lodge where we're looking at the encroachment of white bark pine into the sagebrush grasslands rather than the alpine meadows, which is uh, very odd. Uh, again, uh, what we found, in, is, is that it will take a long time and a high level of agency commitment. But what we also found is that all we have to do is follow the, rush, the strategies proposed in the range-wide strategy and then adjust our treatments based on what the companion document said. I thank you very much for listening, and I think I can take some questions if we have time. I don't think you can compare because the, uh, I'm, I'm going to get my 
feet in a lot of hot water here by answering this, but I'm going to do it anyways, is that uh, in the western white pine, we bred for horizontal resistance. Uh, there's, you know, uh, greater than 28 modes of resistance are things that white bark pine will do, or any five needle pine will do, to ward off the rust from, you know, uh, early needle drop and stem swelling and fungicide production and so on. So what we did in western white pine is, I, if you read it, we were four to eight. We bred for four to eight of those, and the disease was easily able to mutate and overcome those four to eight. So we saw white, you know, western white pine resistance for 20 or 30 years, and then when the disease mutated, then we saw that now we're seeing some major uh, mortality events. So uh, I think white bark pine, first of all, has a higher level of, re of resistance in the na natural populations. And when we outplant those, and you know, we find that we can get a lot, of, lot better resistance in the future. And uh, I don't think you can compare the breeding program that we did to western white pine to what we're going to do with white bark because they're two separate processes. I, I forget how many plush trees we have. Liz, is it 2,000? 2,000 plus trees out there, of which we're going to rotate and hopefully not only maintain genetic diversity, but also vary the uh, modes of resistance and the different levels and types of resistance so that the disease not only can't mutate, but will. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and so in the East Fork and the Bitterroot, how much of that um, sort of maintenance of white bark pine overall cover? Uh, you know, that's, that's a good question. The East Fork of the Bitterroot landscape really had no lands that white bark pine could go to. Whereas the Crown of the Continent did, right? Which is ironic, because the Crown of the Continent had tons of lands above it, and yet it didn't go into there. Whereas the East Fork of the Bitterroot had none, and it stayed in its core areas and actually grew more basal area. If, you know, a uh, colleague, Kathy Cripps, uh, says it's all about the mycorrhizae. And uh, if you, you know, and any, if any encroachment into those is going to take centuries, right? So that you can, so yeah, it, you're right. It, it probably, going into the alpine might be a little harder than people think. Yeah? One more? I know, but Frank Church has blister rust everywhere now, and there are pockets where there's hardly any blister rust. But uh, now we see it a lot all of its range. I, isn't it, Liz, isn't it 30% in the Yellowstone now? Still 25. Still 25. So we see, you know, 25% infection in Yellowstone and so on, and we're seeing that, you know, the, bl the blister rust is going to get everywhere, is that there's no place that's going to escape it. It's all about the wave years and how often you have them. So the, 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 the population isn't going to get it eventually. So either you plan for rust resistance or you're going to miss the bigger picture. Thank you very much. Thank you.